Well, hello and welcome. Well, there's a very important discussion today. How developed is your district? And how do you rank among the 275 districts nationwide? Now, this is one thing that I've been championing and fighting for, and I'm sure you are too, because we are cultivating a habit, if not already established, where you are made to seem as if, even if there's a road to your town, you've been done a favor. Uh, if your school is roofed or some furniture is supplied, you've done a favor, and sometimes we also make a mistake. So the likes of us, the chiefs, will take the linguist and uh, a few elders to go to the DC office. So thank you very much for providing us chairs. This is monies that have been allocated by the state for an individual to supply exactly that. So where is the pleases and where are the thank yous? Even though I believe that those who are doing well should be commended, don't get me wrong. But this attitude of, you know, you have to say please, and when I give it to you, you have to say thank you. I think we need to break away from it. But in order to do that, you need to know where you are ranking. Indeed, is this district doing well at all or is this district failing? So, uh, there is the district league table, which has come out. And UNICEF, in conjunction with CDD, have come up with the district league table as who ranked first and who ranked last. What I want to find out is, what is it that they look at to determine that you were first or you were last? Some district has just been formed and you know, they don't even have an office. Where do they place? Do they rank them separately? But most importantly, you and I buying into this culture so that we can go and ask our DC. Why did I place fifth, or why did you place last, considering what you have? My name is Nanan Sakwa. This is PM Express. When I come back, I'm talking to two very prominent people who know exactly how it come about that we get this table. The move. Well, thank you very much for staying. I've been corrected. 216 district. 275 are the MPs now. So 216 are the districts. So uh, where it is that you place among the 216. Now with me in the studio right next to me is Sarah Haig, who's the chief policy in Ghana. We have to add officer, chief policy officer of UNICEF. Uh, Sarah, you're welcome. Thank you very much. And then I have my own senior brother, Dr. Eric Drew Osai, uh Institute of Local Government Studies, and he's the Dean of Studies and Research. And anything with regards to local government, he understands. So I brought him as well so that he can join the conversation. So while Sarah explains to us how this whole thing comes about, Doctor can uh, analyze it for us. So thank you very much. So Sarah, I'm definitely going to start with you. Uh, the Ghana District League table. Uh, so basically that's all it is, a league of tables of uh, league of districts, who, who plays first and who plays last. How, how do you determine who's first and who's last? Well, we started it last year, so the first district league table was launched uh, at the end of 2014. So this is the second year we're doing it, and the second district league table will be launched next week. Mm -hmm. So this is the first discussion we've had on the district league table this year, so well done, <laughs> jumping on that issue. <laughs> So the process for putting it together was quite collaborative. We discussed a lot with the ministries and the agencies about what sectors are important for people in terms of their well-being and development at the district level. And the ministries and agencies came together with uh, a range of different sectors. So the league table covers six different sectors. It covers health, it covers education, it covers sanitation, security, governance, and water. So some of the really important things, the outcomes that are important for people's well-being on a day-to-day -day basis. Let me get a list again. Health. Health, ed education. education sanitation. Mm -hmm. water, water. Governance. Mm -hmm. And security. Ah. And there's a lot of debate about which sectors should be included and which indicators should be included. And initially, we wanted to include a whole range of things. You know, let's include lots of different indicators. But we tried to keep it simple. Mm -hmm. And we were also very limited by the data that's available in Ghana because you can't get all indicators for all districts. So we were limited by what is available. So with those six sectors, the ministries picked the key indicators that they thought best represented those sectors. Then we simply added them together and averaged them for each district. So let's say on education, mm -hmm. what, what would you look at with regards to education? So for education, the indicator selected was BECE pass rate. Okay. So it tries to summarize the, the progress that is being seen in the education sector, but it's focused on basic education. 
So for health, for example, they're focusing on skilled delivery. So whether a woman is actually going to the clinic and delivering with a skilled attendant next to her. But we try not to focus on the individual sectors. It's, the idea is to amalgamate all of the different indicators and produce a single score for each district, and then you can rank them. And you can see, as you said, which district is in first place all the way down to the district in 216th place. There are some new districts that have been created, mm -hmm. and they complain that they don't even have a desk or mm -hmm. pen to write with. All apart from the DCs pick up, there's nothing there for that district. I mean, so do you have a, a different league for, you know, this league of newcomers, or you lump them all in? And, and I mean, we've got everyone in the list of 216, mm -hmm. but yeah, we noticed that some of those districts which are newly created are not doing as well, because as you said, they don't always have the resources that mm -hmm. they need to be able to do their job, and this is what they've been telling us in the feedback. But other districts that have been newly created are doing better than others. So what we wanted to do, I think, through looking at the league table is to be able to see which districts are doing well and learn from those and which districts are ranking low in the league table and help to boost those and to boost their performance in the league table as it's produced every year. Dr. Sain, is it, is it going to be useful, this? Thank you very table. much. I, I, I think it's going to be useful. It's going to complement the existing um, social accountability tools in their system because this league table is a social accountability system. It's a way of citizens holding the leaders accountable for the delivery of basic services. Uh, but what I think they should have done was, as you mentioned, class the local government into three groups because we have the metropolitan assemblies, the municipal assemblies, and the district assemblies mm -hmm. so that you can have specific indicators for the metros, municipals, and the districts. Because as it were, uh, under education, the indicator is BCE pass rates. But if you go to AMA, AMA, they've gone beyond BCE pass rates. The other third, we look at tertiary education, secondary education. If you go to Adenta Municipal Assembly, they look at secondary education and tertiary education. So I was thinking that they could have looked at those areas. Aside from that, they are also, as you said, they're newly created and then the old, old districts. And then in Ghana, assemblies develop or deliver services per their development plans. Mm -hmm. And these development plans are developed according to certain guidelines. These guidelines are anchored within the medium-term development plan of Ghana. So I was thinking that this particular sectorial indicators that have been developed out of this table would have aligned itself with the guidelines or the medium-term development plan with the assemblies used to prepare their plans. So then, if they don't deliver on it, you can hold them. But as it were, um, this one may not necessarily align itself with the medium term development plan. So the assembly may develop its annual action plan aside from this. So most of these issues may not be a priority for the assembly. May, I'm using my word advisedly. So at the end of the day, they may not deliver on that. For instance, a sector like rural water, they are assessing rural water. But when you come to AMA, it is urban water they deal with. If you go to KMA, they look at urban water. Mm -hmm. So then what rural water are you going to access? If you come to health, for instance, skilled attended at delivery. It is a very good indicator, but the disparities again comes in. So I think it is that's very if you, good. That's if you go to Kolebu. If, if you go, go to, to Kolebu, that's right. Yes, and then um, under governance, they are using the minimum conditions for district administration under the DDF FUAT. We have implemented this FUAT for a number of years, and we realize that some of the district assemblies are doing well. So then we increase, we increase the indicators and then we step up the indicator in such a way that we had an additional indicator for the Metropolitan Municipal Assembly under the UDG, Urban Development Grant. So then the fort will be there, but if you are a well-performing assembly, we always want to increase the standard for you. So I was thinking that having selected the DDF and the fort, they should also go in for the UDG that would assess the Metropolitan and the Municipal Assembly. But this one is not bad. It goes to complement what we have. It is the first one. I'm sure that once they learn the second one, gradually, we'll be able to merge it with the national system. Because one thing that I am always careful about is, if you have such systems operating, we should be able to mainstream it into the national system for us to own the process. Well, this is a project. The project will end. What is going to happen in terms of sustainability? That is what I am concerned. And then the last one is the sanctions regime. I am last, and so what will happen to me? It is just naming and shaming because we haven't conscientized the people to be able to put pressure on the assembly to perform. The national level have not bought into it to sanction the assemblies that were last. 
So we should be able to have a way of getting the Ministry of Local Government to buy into this one so that it, it can even be the basis for allocating the common fund. Uh, let me say with you, Doc, uh, the UK has a regime where if an assembly or a district, let's say you are located $10 million as your budget, mm -hmm. if you don't use up that $10 million, come next year, they will reduce the amount of money they give you. Yeah. So nearer to March, every assembly resurfaces, paints, mm. change, mm. Every, they would literally boost up the, to, to finish that money so they can go and apply for either the same or more. I mean, so those who come last, could we <laughs> say, I, I don't know why they came last, but could that sort of sanction be the world? Then you're not going to get, if we gave you five million today and you came last, well, next year we're giving you three million and your people should question you for it. Why not? It can, it can, uh, but not definitely, not necessarily under the common fund, because of the common fund law, which requires that you give it to them without asking for performance. They can retire, you know, so that can be done. And I can say that DDF uses that particular approach, but this can only be used if it is mainstream into the existing system, so that we don't work at cross purposes, because. Uh, we have a number of indicators, a number of interventions ongoing. This is there, DDF is there, UDG is there. Where do we coordinate so that we can have one single system for Ghana that can be implemented year in, year out? So, Sarah, let me bring you in here. Uh, at the end of the day, the guy who's last, uh, what, what is it that has to make him you know, move up from his last position? Mm. And indeed, we were discussing with the Ministry of Local Government just this issue yesterday. And you had a very good, important point there, Eric, about whether the ministry was engaged. And they've really adopted the district <coughs> lead table since last year. They've really taken it on as their own tool. They even have their own social accountability unit within the ministry. So they're using it to promote social accountability and promote the responsiveness of districts to providing these services. So uh, they're, they're very positive about how it can be used and the impact that it can create to make that pressure to make the districts who are towards the bottom of the lead table aware of the fact that they're ranking low and that they could actually be ranking higher. But what we notice is that some of the districts that are ranking low are ranking there for very good reasons. They might be in very poor regions, they might be in very isolated areas far away from the roads that you were talking about, you know, they might be in regions which are very hard to, to access. So while sanctions might be certainly one idea we could look at, I think it might be even better to see how we could use the district lead table to target resources. And this is something that you touched on yourself, Eric, about whether the ministry and whether the government could be using the district lead table to say, okay, these regions at the bottom, they're not doing so well. Why not? Can we actually target support to those districts to help boost them and push them up the lead table next year? But uh, the, the funds, you know, the locals know that funds are given to district pay the people in there. Mm. So that if a district with uh, 10 people get 10 cities, those with five in it are expecting to get five cities and therefore we should be inching up, you know, proportionally. I mean, how does that, that, how does that play in, the, in this league? Now, at the moment, the, the FOAT minimum conditions that you mentioned, this is the indicator for governance within the district lead table. It looks at whether districts are meeting basic conditions about having meetings and basic administrative issues that they need to meet within the year. And last year we saw that not all of the districts met these minimum conditions and that brought them down in the district lead table. This year, I'm giving out some extra information that will come up next week, but this year we're seeing that all of the districts have met their minimum conditions, which means when you look at the governance indicator, you can see that all of the 216 districts, they're equal in terms of governance. And surely we know that this isn't the case. We know that some districts are doing better than others. Some have poorer performance and need more support. So we don't yet have that way to tell which districts are doing better in administration and which are doing worse. So the district lead table really adds to that information and helps people be more aware and the awareness raising, I think, is a key objective of the league table because when you talk to people, even district staff, um, citizens, civil society out in these districts, they don't have access to this data. Even for UNICEF and CDD, our partner, it was very hard to get hold of this data, the updated indicators for the previous year. Last year it took us three or four months. This year it took quite a bit of time. You can't just go onto the internet and find that information. You can't just 
download a publication and have a quick look for your district and see how is it doing. Mm -hmm. So one objective is really to get that information out there, which is why the media's role is so important to raise awareness on how each district is doing. I mean, I'm from uh, Sio so what, what did mm -hmm. we do last year? You know, and I'm, I'm, at, uh, I'm, I'm on a professional, uh, you know, log ahead with my DC at the moment, you know. And uh, he thought it was personal. I said, no, no, it's not personal. It's just professor, professional war. I need my road done. So, I mean, what, what's, what's, a, a, what's what, what was our position last year? So we were just looking mm. at your district. The mm. position was 49th last very year. Good. It's pretty good, 49 mm. out of 216. There were still obviously 48 districts who were doing quite a bit better mm. than, than your district. So what we need to do on Wednesday is see whether it's gone up but, then we, should do, but then we should do better because you know we have the Kosovo, we have mm -hmm. the Dodi, we have the Marine, uh, we have you know the all, all the hotels, Saint Che Royal. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, he's done well. But we can go, you know, we can do better. <laughs> well, we have to do better. You know, we have to do better. Uh, Dr. Sa, uh, you mentioned something about sustainability, and you know he's, she's constantly going on and on about data collection. Mm. So how, what, what's the best way forward? The sustainability. I, I, I don't know the sustainability strategy UNICEF has mm. with CDT, but the bottom line is that it should be mainstream into the central government system. Mm. Once it is mainstream, state resources can then be used to continue while they withdraw from the system. But let me talk about the baseline, baseline information. Uh, you realize that the sectors, the six sectors they mentioned, education, the baseline is uh, 2012, governor, the baseline is 2012, all the others, the baseline is 2013. Now, if you are using these indicators and you don't have a uniform baseline, no matter when it comes to interpretation, it's difficult to apply it. So I would advise that in future, if they are doing it, they should have a uniform baseline for all the six sectors mm -hmm. and set realistic indicators that can help us mainstream the process. It is a good tool, but we need to, as it were, mainstream it into the system. If not, we have a number of set tools running in the system, and it does not go well for governance. The you know our challenge in this country, everything is policy. I mean, as soon as you bring this thing out, you'll be tagged as MPP mm -hmm. because every DC is an NDC, you know, man. Right. So whoever brings this thing out is MPP. How, how are we going to make sure that we can just look at it at face value and say, look, I need to up my game. There's nothing political about this. Yeah, um, you know, let me explain it to Ghanaians that this, I can say there's nothing political about it because they are basic, basic development uh, initiative or interventions that whether a or party A or B is in power, they should provide. And it is your right as a citizen. Mm -hmm. The fact that you pay taxes is an indication that the local government is expected to provide a service. And these are the minimum services required. Basic education, BEC is the minimum. Sanitation, open defecation, free open defecation is minimum. Mm -hmm. Rural water coverage is minimum. It's a minimum requirement from the local government. So don't look at the DCE. See it as a matter of right. It is your right to demand this. It is the assembly's responsibility to provide this. So when the league comes out and your assembly did not perform well, go to the assembly and ask questions. Because the assembly is like a corporate entity. You have paid your taxes. You are a shareholder in the assembly. You have every right to ask questions. If you don't ask questions, you don't help the system. So people should ask questions. The assembly belongs to them rather than the chief executive. Chief executive can be there at most for eight years, but you are there forever. So for me, where I live, I go to the chief executive, the chief, you are here for eight years. You would live. We live in the vicinity. So make sure you provide the services. If you don't, I'll take you on. That's the ownership. Yes. Sorry, you wanted to come in. Yeah, I wanted to add a point. We found that last year when we launched the district lead table for the first time, the focus ended up inevitably on the district, the individual district. So you yourself, you went to your DCE and you talked to him and you're saying, of course, we should go to our district assembly people, and that's true. But of course, responsibility for the development of a district, it sits with the whole country. Developing an individual district is not only the responsibility of those individual district assembly people. Mm -hmm. And we felt that there needed to be more emphasis on the responsibility of different stakeholders. Because of course, in Ghana, we have decentralization on paper. In reality, it's not so much advanced. Vast majority of resources, they still get allocated from the central level. It's still the central level in Accra that's making those decisions. And of course, traditional leaders have a major role, religious leaders, civil society, and so on. So I think some district level uh, staff, particularly DCEs, felt under pressure. I heard the word sweating last week. Some people were sweating last year when the results came out. 
And of course, I don't think all the responsibility for the development should sit with one individual or one group of people. It has to be shared. I'm going to take a break here, and when we come back, the conversation uh, continues. Now, we're looking at the DCEs themselves. If you pick up this list, uh, how do you feel? I mean, if you came up tops, or do you go around waving your Trump cards and, hey, you'll come and commend me because I brought the district to number one? And if you come up bottoms, what do you do? Don't move. Thank you very much for staying and we are looking at uh, you know, how developed your district is and how do you know where you rank among the 216. Now, just before the break I was wondering that as a DC if you, you know, got to your league and you were first or you were last, uh, first is obviously happy waving his flag uh, but the, the last would come up and say well I didn't get my common fund early. You know, so uh, uh, what do you do then? That's it? He's off the hook? Is there a sort of a trump card? No, I don't think so. But I mean, it's a major issue that resources are not allocated on time. And we heard back from a lot of uh, DCEs and DCDs saying that it, w it made their life much, much harder, that if resources aren't coming out on time, it meant they weren't able to deliver the, the services that they had expected to at the beginning of the year. So I think this is an issue, and I think it's something that the government should be looking at. And I know that they are considering how to make sure resources reach them more directly and more promptly. The, the other thing uh, which, you know, Dr. Ray's was, uh, I mean, like my DC now, I mean, I am stringing his neck for my road. So I'm sure if he has any money left anywhere, he has to go and fix my road. And so he's probably not going to do any water or, you know, do any help or anything, but he has probably spent a lot of money mm. on the road. And in mm. your, in your uh, you know, listings, you probably don't look at your know, road surfacing. So how, how then does that affect him? Well, roads are crucial. I mean, they, they create access to all of these different services, and we want to look at so many different things. But in Ghana, there's no database on roads. We don't have any adequate information on the access that people have to roads in all the different districts, and that's just one area. We want to look at violence, for example, and issues related to child protection, which are very important for UNICEF. There are no databases which give us information about violence and safety in districts. Um, similarly with urban water, it was a real challenge we could not get data on urban water. So a lot of these issues are really missed out because the indicators just don't exist. So we hope also that the leak table will really impel people to improve the data that's collected and improve the da databases that exist so that we can have more indicators as this thing goes forward. Dr. Sun, you raised a very crucial point as regards to that. Uh, all the arms are not the same yeah, and therefore if you're judging them with you know, the same yardstick, uh, you know, some may come up and some will fall short. However, Accra came up 37th mm -hmm. okay, and then Kumasi comes up 160. Now these are literally number one, number two in terms of big boys when it comes to districts. Mm. Uh, so I mean th th that's very poor because if, I, if we checked with you know, BEC and stuff like that and you know, skills at hospitals and stuff like that, I mean they should be number one, number two. You are, you are right, but it will depend on their area of priority in the year of assessment. Because if um, the baseline I'm looking at is oh, but it's a baseline, so you yes. can't say education is not a priority mm. this year. Yeah, uh, maybe in 2012. Mm -hmm. uh, in 2012, their priority was in, on secondary education or tertiary education. Well, I, I shouldn't make I mean excuses for them. Yeah. The bottom line <laughs> is that they should be performing. Mm. In fact, I, would, I was expecting all the metropolitan assemblies to be among the first ten. That's what yeah. I was expecting. Mm -hmm. uh, but looking at the indicators, for instance, if you assess the rural water, I mean, there's and no rural area within a, a, a metropolitan assembly for them to provide rural water to start with. Mm -hmm. you know, so you will not get them providing rural water. And so, however, if, yeah. but however they, they could not even make it. So I mean, that, that, that tells you how bad it is. I mean, if we are looking at boreholes and stuff, and you with your running taps could not even match those with boreholes, then you have well, a big challenge. Then it, it also means the, the indicators are not assessing running taps. The indicators are not assessing that. Maybe they have the taps there running, but the indicator is assessing rural water boreholes. So we come to your uh, metropolitan assembly, you don't have boreholes. So you, 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 you are wrong. Well, you're looking at accessibility you, you, so, so to water. It, we we need to look if it's uh, access to water. That would be fine. So, uh, yeah, Sarah will clear that for yes, you. Yeah, Sarah. for water, it's looking at the access that all rural populations have to water. 
So if uh, a district was totally urban and there was no rural water provision, then they were not penalized for that, obviously. So we only looked at those districts where they have rural water provision. And even in some urban districts, you still have small populations of rural people that do require rural water mm. provision from CDWSA. We really wanted to include urban water provision, but it was too difficult. We simply couldn't get the data. So, you see, uh, data keeps coming up mm. in, in this conversation. Mm. Data, and I'm sure we have to do a whole show on the, on on the need for data. Uh, why? Let me divert a little bit and come back. I mean, because you're in research. I mean, we, as a country, we've moved quite far. Why don't we see the importance of data? That, I mean, everything is based on data. Everyone, everything is based on data. I think we have not prioritized data from the district to the regional to the national level. We have not prioritized this data in terms of our time. We invest a lot more in data. Because we have not prioritized data, most of our projections are not very accurate. And if your projections are not accurate, you can be sure that when it comes to implementation, you fail. So I am not surprised <laughs> we, the pace of development uh, is going that way. Mm -hmm. Because the basic assumption on which the development projections are made are normally wrong. So what we need to do is to support the statistical service, decentralize the statistical service, make sure that every district has a statistical officer, equip them with the tools and the things that they need to collect and keep accurate data so that we'll be able to do our planning on accurate data. We are not investing in data management. Sarah, staying on data, I mean, so who gets access to this information? Mm. So this information should be public. In other countries, as I said, you might find it online on a website or you might find it printed annually so you can go and look at your district's data. In Ghana, it's very hard to get hold of and you have to go to the right person in the right office sitting in Accra that has that information and persuade mm -hmm. them to give it to you. But I'm pleased to say that even just in the one year since we started the district league table, there's been some improvements. Mm -hmm. So CWSA, who is responsible for rural water, they noticed that they had some gaps in their data last year. So in some rural communities, they couldn't say how much water they were providing to the population. This year, they went back and they did a massive survey to fill those gaps and to improve their data collection. So it's promoted that improvement of data already. So we're moving in the right direction. Governance is one which is quite interesting because, I mean, there are certain areas where governance is not present in anywhere. No post office, no fire service, no police station. Mm -hmm. uh, you're lucky to have one nurse, you know, who comes every now and then. So in terms of governance, I mean, uh, how, how do you look at the governance cross board? This is a big issue because uh, the Ministry of Local Government was discussing it with us recently and we were looking at the issue about how you assess accurately the quality of governance and it's quite subjective. And the indicator that they have been using is whether the district reaches its minimum conditions within the FOAT. So whether it holds the right number of meetings, whether they're following the administrative and financial procedures and so on. And as I mentioned, this year we will see next week every single district met those minimum conditions. So it doesn't really give you that information on which are doing better and which are doing worse. So beyond that, there's very little information out there short of doing a massive nationwide survey on governance, which maybe needs to be done. There's no information out there at the moment about the quality of governance in these different districts. So, Sam, that's, I mean, uh, um, good governance is, it's almost a right that you wake up every it morning is. and mm -hmm. you need mm. uh, fresh air, and next to fresh air is good governance. Because almost all, I mean, you could only do just good governance and everything will follow. basically, yeah. you know, follow. So, I mean, how do you go forward when you know, you're not even sure you're getting basic governance. So I'll, I'll advise um, UNICEF that uh, when it comes to good governance, they shouldn't look at only the minimum conditions for the FUAD, because the minimum conditions for the FUAD has other things apart from the good governance she's talking about. Um, they should go deep down the, the unit committees, the substructures. Mm -hmm. That is where governance is felt mm -hmm. at the local government level. And uh, if you have the chief executive in place and you have the assemblies in place, it is not enough to say that there is good governance. Go talk to the people, go to the unit committees, review the minutes of the unit committees, and then you see whether good governance is there or not. I know it's difficult for you to do all of that mm. because of the, the space of time involved in doing this. But I can tell you that there is some good level of good governance in certain local governments. It doesn't cut across the whole country. Uh, the indicators may be different, but I want to say that there is good governance. So I would advise that we move beyond using the DDF results 
and then go to the specific assembly or the individual assemblies and then go down there to the unit committees. By the end of the day, in our local government system, it is the unit committees that matter because they are closer to the action spot. So if we, you can include that to review the minutes of the unit committees for you to know how closer the governance process is to them, it will really help. Sarah, what's, what's it in for the UNICEF? Mm. I think UNICEF has a, a number of objectives, but we are working with civil society to promote accountability. I think in Ghana, so many things work well. We have so much in Ghana in terms of the systems that are in place, health systems, education systems, which are the envy of many countries in the region. But at the end of the day, whether people know what their rights are, to what they're entitled, and how their districts and their communities are doing, I think that's a big gap. So what we wanted to do is really promote access to information, give people this basic information, look at your district, see where it's performing next week when we launch the new district lead table. Has it gone up? Has it gone down? If not, why not? Can you speak to your district assembly? Can you speak to civil society, to traditional leaders in your community and see if you can mobilize some change? Because we really feel that up until now, people just don't have enough information at their fingertips to be able to even know how well the district is doing in comparison with their neighbors or in comparison with districts in other regions. Now, at the moment, you're collecting your data from central government. Mm -hmm. Central government is the one that puts every DC there. So mm -hmm. basically, their boys are heads of every institution. So if it's five, aren't they going to say, well, he got seven and a half and he got eight, you know, instead of three, you know, jack up the figures so that they don't look too bad? Mm. I mean, the data itself, the raw data, only comes from the districts. So when it comes to health and the number of women that deliver in a clinic, obviously people in Accra, they don't know that. Okay. It comes from the district. It's the district giving that raw data, saying, okay, 700 women last year delivered in a clinic. Then it's up to the central government to gather all of that data from the 216 districts and aggregate it into the database. But then that information needs to go back. It needs to be fed back to the communities, to the citizens of the country, for you to be able to know how well your districts and your communities are doing. And that is the feedback loop that I think that we're really missing in Ghana. The, the, I think there's the same mention during the break that, uh, I mean, going to the district yourself and, you know, getting the figure, probably even match it with what uh, the, government, the government says. I mean, just bring the district health officers and look, give me this data and then call local government and say, look, what do you have on this? I mean, w would it be too much or? It would be too much. I mean, it's, certainly, it's not our place. It's not UNICEF's place. We have these systems in place. Government of Ghana has good statistical systems. They are there. They just need to be further developed. For example, sanitation, there's very little information on sanitation at the district level. Mm -hmm. So we found it very difficult to pick an indicator on sanitation. We came up with quite a limited one that looks at open defecation free. Mm -hmm. But we know that this year, the government is developing a new information system on sanitation. So they've told us that next year, they will have all of this new information and new indicators on sanitation, so we'll be able to include those. So there is progress that's being made, and it's for the government of Ghana to keep improving those systems that are already there. Uh, uh, hmm. Mr. Sai, well, I mean, you don't have anywhere to go other than government to get the, uh, to the details. Otherwise, then you have to be jumping up and down 260 <laughs> districts, you know, asking how many women gave birth here, you know, how many people are defecating outside, what were your results? You see, all the sectors have district departments within the district assemblies. So if you go to education, we have the education directorates. They prepare the annual report and feed it to the regions, and the region sends it to the center. When you come to sanitation, we have environmental sanitation department. When it comes to rural water, we have the Community Water and Sanitation Agency. When it comes to security, we have the District Police Command, and we even have the Justice and Security Committee of the Assembly. So my position is that you can collect your data from the center, but validate it with the District Assembly, and then just be sure that the data is accurate. Because as and when the day passes, new data comes up. And as and when new data comes up, it takes a year for the data to be sent to Accra. You know, so if you have a current data at a district level, it helps to make the table very realistic rather than relying on what was brought from the center without validating from the district. 
I mean, we're saying all these things, but let me go back to some, and pick something you said mm. earlier on in terms of sanctioning. That's right. What, what can be done so that, as a DC, when you hear the leak coming, you know, you, you have sleepless nights? What, what can we do? This is a social accountability tool. And the social accountability tool um, depends on the citizens to demand accountability from leadership as of now. Now that we have not mainstreamed it into the main governance system of Ghana, Sanctions regime from the center would be difficult. As time goes on, we will be able to apply some sanctions. But for now, UNICEF and the whole of Ghana can rely on the citizens to demand their pound of flesh if the DC is not performing. And here, if you are you were last or you were above 100, what you can do is that go to your assembly member. The next assembly meeting, the assembly member should table a motion asking the chief executive to explain why ABCD has occurred. And as Sarah said, it's not only the chief executive, the other heads of department and agencies who should be responsible for providing educational services, sanitation, rural water, health and security, and then governance. So for instance, the assembly can invite the district director of education to explain why BEC pass rate is falling. You know, so these are the things they can do for now. Until it is mainstreamed into the governance system, then you can use other sanctions, such as failing to renew the tenure of office of a chief executive, transferring a district officer from that district to another district and serve as second in command to somebody as a punitive measure or withholding some resources. But again, I am against withholding resources if technical officers fail to perform because you punish the community unnecessarily through no fault of theirs. So then the sanctions regime should be personal to the leaders who refuse or failed to deliver on their mandate. And chief executive's tenure of office should not be renewed if they fail to comply with this once it is mainstream. But we are not there yet. Now it's a social accountability tool. We rely on the people to make noise about it, to hold their leaders accountable, hold the league table, and then ask questions about it. That's what we expect citizens to do. You see, we, we have a culture where at every given time, those who make the complaints the most are those who are in opposition. Because if your party is in power, and then you make too much noise, then you're embarrassing your party. Uh, to the point that somebody says, because I'm jumping up and down about the road, then I must be MPP. You know, so I'm thinking, are you telling me that if the MPP was in power, I would be happy to drive on this road? I say, even if Jesus Christ was the DCE, I want my road. You know, but that's the culture. They put that mm. fear in you that, well, mm. I can't go and complain mm. because it means mm. I'll be tagged with some party. And if you're not bold enough, you just recall in your shell. So how do we... But no, no, we should, you see, I keep on telling people that the business of local government is expected to be non-political. My mm. rights to use good road doesn't depend on my political affiliation. <laughs> Once I pay taxes, you are supposed to deliver. Mm. Once you are there as a local government and you are supposed to be bring governance closer to me, you are supposed to deliver. Go out there and complain. People must be assertive in the, the, the demanding what is right to them. I mean, they, they should claim their rights in governance. Nobody is doing us a favor if they construct a road. Nobody is doing us a favor if they construct um, a school building. Nobody is doing us a favor if they construct a health post. No, this, it is all right. Wages. Yes, they, yeah. uh, well, but they will not use their wages. <laughs> Whatever monies they are using are monies transferred to the district because of us, the people. So if they are not performing, ask questions. And I've always been telling people that we have the public relations and complaints unit within the district assemblies. Walk in there and ask questions. Same as if you have a share in the company, you go and ask questions about how the company is performing at an AGM. Ask questions about how the assembly is doing. Because the assembly belongs to you. For all you know, everybody working in the assembly did not come from the area. They come from other places. They've been transferred to the place to come and work to serve you. And they use their, your taxes to pay them. If you don't demand accountability, you mess up the place and go to where they come from. So people must demand accountability for services. Nobody is doing them any favor. They are, they are rendering the services because the government thinks they are there, and the government have transferred resources, and they are also paying taxes. So, so what, what's the communication plan for, for DLT? Well, I mean, because what's the trick or what's the to get people to buy into it? The communication plan really is to, to work with uh, the government and mm. to enable them to be able to put out this information. But we also want to work with a range of different partners. Media is the biggest partner for us, I think. The, the reach that the media have to get this information out there and get people looking at where their district is, I think that is probably one of the most powerful tools that we have. 
and not just in Accra, of course, but in the regions themselves and getting regional media involved. But we also have a range of different strategies to get the information out, so it's all away available on a website. Um, it's on Facebook, so you can download all the information when it's published next week on Wednesday. And uh, we're trying to use other partners like civil society, a number of organizations that really work in some of the most isolated, far-flung areas of Ghana to give them the information and help them to use it on a regular basis. It's, it's owned by everybody. It's fully public. Anyone can take it and run with it and try and track how their district is doing year on year. And we want to keep doing this forever. Dr. Sang, you see, uh, Afrobarometer comes up with those, this thing they do, right? And what I find amazing is the, uh, the three northern regions. Mm. I mean, if you look at their results, I mean, they live in Manhattan. I mean, they are, for them, the economy couldn't have been better, their lives couldn't have been better, jobs, opportunity could have... I mean, you listen to the responses they get, and it's, like, fantastic. But then you look back, and they don't have a hospital, they don't have a doctor, they don't have water. So what's the correlation? Because, you know, we, <laughs> we, we are looking to boost the, uh, the district. Then people say, look, we are fine. So I mean, where do you go from there? So that's, that, that is why I, I questioned some of the indicators. I questioned some of the indicators. You know, um, these kinds of assessments normally looks at systems rather than uh, physical development and projects. You know, if you want to look at the physical development projects, then these districts in the northern region may be last because they don't. Most of them don't have them, but they have good systems. You know, so in um, looking at going forward, looking at the table, I think we should combine physical projects and indicators as well, uh, so that we can reflect the situation on the ground. Because as it is now, if you have the first district maybe coming from one of the three northern regions, one will conclude that they are okay. But you go there and in physical terms, the situation on the ground doesn't reflect the fact that they are okay. So what we do under the circumstance, the only thing we can do is assess systems and assess physical infrastructure as well. Then the disconnect will be very, very clear. The conversation continues. Don't move. Thank you very much for staying. We are talking about district league table. How well is your district performing? And with me in studio is Sarah Haig, who is a Chief Policy Officer, UNICEF, and Dr. Udro Sain, uh, Dean of Studies and Research at the Institute of Local Government Studies. But anytime the break comes on, something new comes up. So Sarah, you raised something about, you go within the, north, the three northern regions, and there are districts in the same region who are doing better than, than others. And I find that intriguing. Mm -hmm. how, how are they doing better? I mean, we are all here. We are all suffering. So how does one do better than the other? Yeah. It's if, very... if the other one is not a newly created one. No, not in all cases. And it's very interesting because normally the story about Ghana is that we have a better off south and we have a poorer north. Mm. And we always expect the north to be doing worse than the south. Mm. But the story is changing. It's not like that anymore. We're starting to see some rebalancing of resources. And some districts are, are pulling ahead, whilst others are being left behind. So this year, uh, we were looking at how districts are doing within region. And within, say, the northern region, or within the upper west region, for example, we see, as you said, some districts which are pulling ahead mm. and doing very well. There's a couple of districts which are doing better in the northern region than two-thirds of the districts in Greater Accra. So these individual districts in northern... Why, why, why though? I mean, why? The issue for everyone, about every single district, is why. And there are a whole range of different issues. It could be that your DCE is very passionate, very mobilized, and he's really pushing the issues. Or it could be that you live in a very isolated area. Or it could be that you're able to raise more internal funds within your district and you have more resources. But ultimately, if we put this information out there and make it public, then we can use it. And I think this idea about using the district lead table to try and better target resources and support those districts that are ranking very, very low is a very valuable one. Let me go back to the political issue. I mean, if you look at the seasons coming up, mm. uh, primaries and this, I mean, is this what the you know position is going to be branding left, right, and centre? Say, hey, look at it, look at it, and divert the whole attention from just the pure rights of the people who should get, rather than the propaganda. 
So I'm sure if we don't guard against it, it is likely to happen. So once it is launched, we should undertake a number of media campaigns, a number of sensitization, a number of awareness raises, so that the political activities does not cloud or, uh, as it were, crash out this particular uh, system. You know, because it is likely to happen, as, as you, you rightly said. It is something that we have to guard against. So UNICEF makes some funds available to support continuous sensitization so, so that the political activities would not override this good uh, initiative. Uh, I know the uh, local government has bought into it. I think it's a huge, huge step. Because normally you realize that, you know, uh, you'll be gathering the data and government is not interested at all. That's a huge step. W what more should they do or can they do? What I, what, what I want to say is that there should be open admission and then um, sensitization and explanation to the whole of Ghana that effective maybe 2016, the, the indicators used by the district league table has been adopted by the nation as a way of assessing performance of local government. Once you make that open declaration, awareness is raised among all the local governments. It then becomes competition amongst them. So to be, be, able be, be below to 100, you are out of office? Definitely. Below 100. And uh, you know, there are normally performance contracts signed between the chief executive and other key officers. The coordinating director signs it with the local government service. <coughs> The chief executive signs with the office of the president. So if local government buys into these indicators, they can also work with the office of the president to incorporate it into the performance contract of the chief executive and the performance contract of the coordinating directors. I'm not sure how it can work into the activities of civil society organizations and other departments within the district assembly the who also may have one respons responsibility or the other in supporting the assemblies to meet this. But what I can say is that we should properly mainstream it and there are a lot of sectors in the system. Mm -hmm. So we need, uh, we, we need to find a way of coordinating so that we can have one nationally accepted standard for assessing performance of local government. Currently, we have the DDF what running. We have the UDG running. We have the district league table also running. And then we even have PFM templates developed by the Ministry of uh, Finance and the Ministry of Local Government to also for citizens to use to assess the performance of their local government through a social accountability system. Some of them are also running a um, citizen scorecard to score the performance of the district assemblies. We have a number of these interventions ongoing. What we need to do as a nation to coordinate the approach, harmonize all of them, develop a national district league table out of all of that, adopted by the nation, implement it, and then sensitize the people and the district assemblies. Then we can demand performance. So, I mean, that's going to be powerful, isn't it? I mean, is there any intention of bringing them all together? I mean, you are the bigger boys. You probably have money than all of them. You bring <laughs> them together and say, look, let's put all your indicators together and this is the way we are going. Mm. I mean, the, the district leader will just try to cover these issues of governance that the Ministry of Local Government wanted to include. So that it has been the objective. Mm. And I really think it's been very impressive that the local government ministry, initially they were quite apprehensive, skeptical about, skeptical about mm. the district lead table last year. They were worried about how it would be used, particularly in the media, how it would be viewed in the public and so on. And I think they should be really commended for having stepped forward this year and saying that they're going to take it on board and they've really adopted it as a project within the ministry. So whether it can be fully institutionalized within the government and become a real Ghana government initiative that will continue year on year. If that mm. happened, I think that would be very good indeed. No, but back to my question is that, I mean, the, if the government adopts this and doesn't adopt the ones that are running, uh, it then becomes, you know, why theirs and not ours? I mean, mm. but it's, since we are all aiming for a better district, I mean, is there any way we can work together? Because after all, we want the district to work well. And it gives you more people to go to the district to collect the data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that is a, the objective, that they wanted it to cover all of these different issues. So not just whether a district is being run correctly and reaching its minimum standards for administration, but to cover that as well as all the social sectors and the economic issues that matter to the people in the districts. Let, let me come to, before we close, Accra and Kumasi. How come they are not number one and number two? Mm. I mean, I, I just find it amazing. It's a good question. And actually, we looked at whether metropolitans and municipalities are more likely to be in the top of the league table because we presume that they would have more resources and be better hmm. funded and have better capacity. But it's not the case across the board. We found that um, 
uh, one third of metropolitan and municipality districts are found in the bottom of the league table and Kumasi last year was a very good example. So we need to see next week on Wednesday whether Kumasi has managed to push itself up the league table this year. We won 60 is embarrassing. It is. It is. And Tom Alimo Metropolitan Assembly is 52 on the league table and they scored 65 just like a Swedish man. Metropolitan See, Assembly. That, that, that's, uh, yeah. so, uh, so the, the citizens of that district should be very, uh, to have lots of questions to ask. The assembly members especially, the assembly members, because they go to assembly meetings, they approve the budget, they approve their plans, they should go down there and make sure that the assembly is delivered. They should go down there and see that these things are happening on the ground. So citizens must ask questions from the assembly members. Assembly members must ask questions from the departments and the stakeholders within the district that are responsible for delivering these services. But of course it proves that some districts are doing something right. So last year the number one district was Tanu South in mm -hmm. Yeah. They were very happy to have their best efforts recognized as being, you know, number and one position. It's a very clean district. It mm -hmm. is. Yeah, here's it a very is. clean district. So they're doing something right, and other districts can learn from them. So yeah. I think. But if you look problem. at the second district, it's the one with Municipal, mm -hmm. and then followed by Denchembo, Akwechia. You know, these are not um, districts that are uh, better than all the others, but it has to do with systems. Mm. It has to do with systems and also leadership. Mm. Systems and leadership. Leaders must be committed to the development agenda of the citizen. That is it. If you are committed to producing development, producing results, then you'll be able to meet it. And when you look at the man, the scores, the intervals are just one, 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 one. What it then means is that they will be able to achieve it. Mm. But the difference between the second place district and then the first place district is one. The highest 76, Tano South, second in Samuel Madrid Municipal, 75. So what is it that Tano South is doing in Bronga Afo that is own Adwiji cannot do in the eastern region? Yeah. So Oko Vandapo, you were 160, and Kojo Bonsu, you were 37. I don't know, Oko Vandapo is 37, and uh, Kojo Bonsu is 160. Quite embarrassing for the size and the amount of money. I mean, Ghana should be borrowing money from your district, mm. not you ranking 160. So all citizens uh, that live within this district, uh, you should be asking your assemblyman, Ayadeni mm. Akaitri. Thank you very much. Thank you. And as I say, tomorrow we'll be back to do this all over again. Thank you very much for watching. <laughs>